one of the challenges that big tech has had over the years is they gather so much data about people that how do they process that data? And that's this is really the the start of AI. This is why they started to develop AI is because they they just had so much data. Um, how could they analyze that? Facebook and and uh, Google and those other sites have been able to determine people's emotions by what they click on, what they like, um, what they type in, all of these things, that actually determining people's emotions is actually a pretty easy thing for them to do. I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we are gonna be talking about a really important but overlooked topic, and this is the topic of privacy and specifically online privacy. And who better to do that with than Glenn and Eric Meter? from the Privacy Academy. Welcome to the show, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you. So I've done a really brief intro there, but for people who are not familiar with you guys and your work, can you please introduce yourselves? Sure, my name is Glenn Meter. I am, um, the. we, we founded the uh, Privacy Academy together. I work with Eric and we have a team of people where we teach people how to be private and secure. I also run a newsletter. I have a newsletter at Liberty Zeppelin, uh, libertyzepp.com and uh, you know, I think if you want me to go into a little bit of the de the, the background there, uh, we do privacy for a purpose. And that purpose is because we believe that privacy is essential for liberty. And it's, you know, there's a lot of freedom fighters out there, but people don't understand the, the role that privacy plays in protecting our liberty. And that's really what is my mission, I feel. And I'm, I'm, I, I am blessed to be able to work with my son. It's the best thing in the world. Awesome. Is there anything you want to add to that, Eric? Yeah, no, I agree exactly with what Glenn's saying. It's a fantastic opportunity to work together. Uh, I love being in the freedom community. Every day I feel inspired, even though things get crazy sometimes. But yeah, I agree. Privacy is very, very important. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. Awesome. So... I think when most people hear that privacy is important, it's something that we intrinsically know and recognize and practice day to day. But when you say that privacy is important or crucial for freedom and liberty, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you want to go to the obvious parallel, just imagine the founding fathers, you know, what, what would have happened to the founding fathers if England had the level of surveillance that our government has now. And what would have happened? The, the founding father, the England would have known everything that they say, everything that they, every person they meet with, what they say, what they're communicating with each other, where their money is, how much money they have. They have, they'd have access to their money, um, all of this stuff. What would have happened if to the founding fathers, if, if England had that level of surveillance? They would have been rounded up and shot. And I think that's maybe a little bit, the parallels aren't exactly the same with today, but there they are in a lot of ways where if you don't have privacy, you don't have freedom. You don't have freedom of thought because we self-censor. If we think that we're being observed, if we think that we could be in trouble based on what we say or what we, who we talk to, who we associate with, um, all of that stuff, then we self-censor. And um, it is really, uh, there's a lot of people that, that reach out to me and say, you know, you're really brave for doing what you're doing. You know, I'm scared of big brother and big tech, and uh, I don't wanna be saying this stuff, but you know, you've gotta have the courage, but you've also gotta have the knowledge that you can talk and and say what you want to say and believe what you want to believe without getting penalized for that without them coming back and penalizing you so that's my two cents what do you have to say eric uh, i mean i'm sure everyone has heard the saying information is power it's very true the whole name of the game is them collecting as much data as they can on you everyone knows that google spies facebook spies but it's much deeper than just selling you like target ad slots. They're creating a profile on you and they want to use that profile to manipulate you and just control the, the whole scene. We all know that in today's fast paced world, it's harder than ever to live a healthy lifestyle. 
Just about everyone is struggling with gut issues, stress, inflammation, fatigue, or immune health issues. Most of it comes down to diet, but getting nutrient-rich food consistently isn't always easy or affordable. With hectic schedules, processed foods, and the rising cost of healthy options, we all need a cheat code as the game of life gets a little bit more difficult. My cheat code is Optimal Human. With over 90 ingredients, including powerful vitamins and other nutrients, one serving of Optimal Human helps me fulfill my daily nutritional needs. And in my opinion, it tastes better than other green supplements on the market. Optimal Human contains powerful superfoods like organic reishi mushroom for your brain, turmeric root for your joints, beetroot for cardiovascular health, CoQ10 for cellular health, and prebiotics for gut health. It's simple to integrate into your daily life. Just add one scoop to water, a smoothie, or your protein shake and get an instant delicious nutrient boost. Try Optimal Human today and get 50% off your first month by going to OptimalHuman.com forward slash Zuby. One more time, that's OptimalHuman.com forward slash Zuby. Go check it out. So I think a lot of people who are quote unquote normies, I don't mean that in a disparaging term, but I mean by people who are not involved in any type of quote unquote liberty movement or people who are uh, very online and going down these various things, right? I think most people tend to think, well, I have nothing to hide, right? You can tell some people, hey, Facebook is tracking you, Google is tracking you, uh, your phone network, your um, internet service provider, whatever it may be. And they're like, yeah, I know, who cares, right? I'm not doing anything bad. I'm not some type of, uh, I'm not planning some evil plot to overthrow the government or harm anybody or whatever. So if they take some of my data, you know, they've, they've already got it, right? They kind of just shrug. Why is, well, number one, is that a naive perspective? And two, if so, why? Well, it absolutely is, I believe, a naive perspective because, um, you know, privacy is not about protecting what you do that's wrong. It's, it's about uh, protecting what you believe. Like, like I said, it's the, it's the cornerstone of, our, of who we are. Uh, we want to direct our own lives. We want to be able to um, live our lives without persecution. And as we've seen over the past many years is, you know, attitudes can change and you can get persecuted for something that you said 10 years ago. And actually Canada is doing that right now where they're trying to pass a law where they can persecute somebody or prosecute somebody for something they said 10 years ago online. And uh, it, it is something, well, here's the way I look at it is, we know that privacy is important and essential in many parts of our lives. You know, we close the bathroom door, we close the curtains at night. Um, those things we just, we have instinctual awareness of, you know, this is our space. This is no one else's business. This is, this is my life. I can live my life the way I want to live it. Just stay out. But when it comes to being online, we don't have that instinctual awareness of how people are spying on us and what they're doing to get our data and, and really track us in really creepy ways. And uh, so, you know, when you say, I'm not doing anything wrong, well, okay, so is that okay? Are you, do you feel comfortable with somebody at Google listening in on your conversations that you have in your home? Or somebody uh, turning on your webcam without your awareness and they're watching you? I mean, that's creepy stuff, right? And, but it goes beyond creepy because what they're doing now is they're putting the pieces in place for the CBDC and the digital ID and the social credit system to actually take this information and use it against us in a much deeper way. And, and what Eric was saying is, you know, information is power. When they have information about you, they have power over you. And, um, so, so when they get this information, they have power over you and that's, that's real power. And I will also say it's not just big tech and big brother, there's also hackers and scammers. So when we talk about privacy and security, there's really three threats. So there's hackers and scammers, there's big tech, and then there's big brother. And all of them try to do the same thing. They all try to gain information on you. This is what data breaches are when you get uh, AT&T breached and uh, t Telegram just got all of their information sc uh, scraped from Telegram, uh, Sony, Marriott, Target, all of these places, they get their 
database is breached, that is hackers. They're not. So let's say a hacker attacks a target and they get the database. It's not targets information. They're after your information. And they get that from all of these different places, pull it together into one profile. They want to make a big database on you and they're going to use that data against you. And it, that's what big tech does. That's what big brother does. That's what hackers and scammers do. They all try to do the same thing. That stance that you brought up originally, it, it does come from naivety. I think it comes from the fact that we experience freedom so much that we don't think about how bad things can get because the whole thing of, you know, I'm not doing anything bad. That's because, first of all, that's a greater good argument, but then also people don't understand when governments get totalitarian, they're the ones who decide what is good or bad. So once they start removing freedom of speech laws, maybe you have a certain opinion and then you'll get punished for that. So we have to think ahead with that as well. Yeah. I hear that. So you've talked about some of the things that they are doing to get data. What are some of the things that people may not be aware of? You mentioned a couple of things in passing, for example, switching on webcams remotely and listening in on conversations when you may not be aware of it. Um, what exactly is happening there? What is, you know, I, I, I know people, again, this is one of those things that people have some sort of hazy idea about, but it never seems to be sort of totally confirmed what exactly is happening and what is legal and what is not. So can you speak around that? Yeah. So let, let's look at Google. Um, Google is so, so if you look at Google, so 91% of all searches globally are with Google. Um, you've got Android, which is, I think, 74% of the world uses Android. Um, you've got 65% uh, of the world uses the Chrome browser. 27% um, of the world uses Gmail. All of these products that Google creates are Trojan horses. They're, they're specifically designed to steal our data. That is the actual intended purpose of these, uh, of these products that Google creates, to, to spy on you, st steal your data, and then use that data against you. And uh, I, I think one of the creepy ways that that people are not aware of is there's uh, there's a gentleman, Dr. Robert Epstein, and he is he has done tremendous research on Google and Google's power, and so uh, he has uh, some really great articles on how he has done studies on just the different aspects of of Google. So one of the things is what kind of effect does Google have if they just uh, rearrange the, the first couple uh, results of a search? So because 50% 50, 50 of people click on the first two results, those two search results, and then 90% of people click on the first 10 results. So if Google just changes those search results to favor, let's say, in an election of, of a certain candidate, um, the, the results that they have found with that is, is really shocking, actually, like changing up to 48% of people's, uh, views on a particular candidate, even people who are quite set on, okay, I'm going to vote for this candidate. They can change that. They, he has tested that all around the world. He's tested that in India and in local elections, national elections, and the numbers hold out. Now, that's only one of the ways that Google can, and I realize this isn't exactly what you asked me, but um, this is only one of the ways that Google can manipulate us because they also have like auto, auto the, the auto suggest. So you'd start typing into Google something and then it gives you suggestions. That actually has tremendous results on what people uh, believe also, but then their most powerful thing is censorship and shadow banning. So Google, which is really has been the avenue that most people around the world get their information. It, Google has tremendous, tremendous power to manipulate us and to control us. And they do that with 
all of these tools that they have. Um, and I'll just give you a quick example. So uh, Safari, why does Safari use Google as a search engine? Because Google pays them $20 billion a year to do that. They're not paying them $20 billion a year for nothing. They're doing it because they, they really, really, really want your information. And um, that's why Google Chrome is the default browser because Google pays every manufacturer to make Google the cr default uh, search, uh, browser on the computer. So I don't know if that really, I went off a little bit on that answer, but I hope it gives a good perspective of that. Yeah, I can step into a little bit. Um, one thing that really shocked me, I read an article by Quartz. They have a good article about it, how Google and a lot of the Silicon Valley area was funded by the NSA and the CIA at, during its start. And they called their operation birds of a feather. It's like the saying, birds of a feather flock together. And basically what they said is like birds, when they flock, they flock together, is they move in predictable patterns. So they wanted to create the internet because they believed that people would form themselves in groups and then they could be moving in predictable pa patterns as well. So they want to collect as much data as they can and then they can predict and manipulate. So a really good example of this was in 2012, Facebook did a study to see if they could manipulate people's emotions based off of what they were shown on their feeds. They did about like 700,000 people. Half of them they showed uh, like gore, dead dogs, very disturbing images, and it uh, dramatically affected them emotionally. And then the other half was like cute babies, happiness, all this stuff. And they wanted to see how much they could emotionally manipulate them. Quick, and they quick, proved quick, that they could. Quick, mm -hmm. quick question on this one. How did they monitor people's emotions remotely at that scale? Yeah, actually, I, I'm not I'm not sure about that. I did wonder that when I read the article. No, but this is this this question actually is a very good question because this is one of the challenges that big tech has had over the years is they gather so much data about people that how do they process that data? And that's, this is really the, the start of AI. This is why they started to develop AI is because they, they just had so much data. Um, how could they analyze that? And that, that's what they came up with. And I can, we can talk about AI if you want to, cause we've got some pretty amazing stories about AI, but, um, Facebook and, and, uh, Google and those other sites have been able to determine people's emotions by what they click on, what they like, um, what they type in, all of these things, that actually determining people's emotions is actually a pretty easy thing for them to do. And um, the, the, there's a recent whistleblower, uh, I can't remember, uh, Howen or I can't remember her name, but she was from Facebook and she said, she and she proved, she had plenty of documents that she brought out and she said, you know, every single time that Facebook comes up with a question of whether to do something in their best interest or the best interest of the person where, um, you know, they're, they're always going to choose Facebook. So in other words, they, Facebook knows that keeping people agitated, keeping people feeling worthless, insecure, um, all of this stuff makes them engage with Facebook longer. And so this, that's how they gear, Facebook, that's how all social media uh, platforms are geared now is to keep them engaged, regardless of whether it is in the best in interest of the person. So do you think that when it comes to these big tech companies, let's be specific, let's talk about Google and Facebook, because they're probably the ones with the most data, I would imagine, certainly Google. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Facebook, too, because it's all of meta. Um do you think that they initially, the initial goal was to collect so much data and in your words, use it against people? Or do you think this is just something that as the platforms have grown and they've grown to multi billions of users and they've become so global that it's sort of inevitably led to this situation? Because what I'm trying to understand and get a good picture, at least of your opinion on is, where's the line between hey we're a company we're trying to grow and we're trying to make money and we're trying to return to our shareholders versus hey we've got this sinister plan to 
collect a bunch of people's data and later down the line, perhaps decades down the line, we're going to use this somehow against the population. I don't want to, I don't know if that is your, your take, but where, where do you kind of draw the line there? Where do you think that balance is between just trying to make money and trying to do a lot more than that and perhaps something sinister? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know what the origin of that was. The, I, I think the obvious answer is uh, power corrupts. And when they, the more power they get, the more they use that power, the more it attracts the people that are in power, such as government. I mean, we saw with uh, Twitter, when Elon Musk took it over, he had the Twitter files and re he showed that there was like a whole team of FBI agents working behind the scenes. Obviously, that's happening at Facebook and YouTube and all of these other places where they are actively working to censor people. Uh, I'm sure Facebook is working very closely with the NSA uh, because the NSA realized, OK, this is a great way to, you know, show people's relationships uh, and, and do this whole mapping of relationships. But we can also get everyone's uh, pictures and facial identities and, and also their their emotions, all of that stuff. So it was a treasure trove of information. So I don't know if it started off being that way but it definitely attracted corruption and because of the power they have they are absolutely the most powerful company ever to exist not not facebook only but like facebook google microsoft amazon apple the most powerful companies ever to exist and not just because they're multi-trillion dollar companies but because of this ability to manipulate people is is crazy how do you think that could worst be used against people okay so this is where i got it i have a really good story and this is actually a story from eric so um we we were doing a lot of research i, I was doing a lot of research into ai and uh, social media for a number of years and eric eric had an experience that really kind of shook me and him it shook him definitely but um can i tell this story eric you mind? So um, when Eric was just out of high school, he, he went through some hard times, you know, just like a lot of kids do. He went through some pretty hard times. And one time uh, he was working as a chef in a uh, or, or line cook in a restaurant around, around the age of 20, I think. And he was having a particularly bad day. And he listened to one song. So he had headphones on. He was listening to one song over and over and over the whole day while he was at work. And he was angry and he was upset. And um, so after work, he gets off and he just sits down and looks at, at TikTok. And he sees this meme that comes up. And it's this really kind of dark looking cartoon picture of a chef that an angry chef with like really drawn with like squiggly lines and everything and it was really kind of a disturbing picture and then but the headline of it said when you're a line cook and you're angry and depressed and you listen to the same song and i think it even mentioned the song 24 hours a day and you want to kill yourself that's what this meme said. And, and, uh, Eric was like, I, I think this is the thing actually, cause he had heard me talking about, uh, social media a lot and privacy, but this, this is one of the things that really shook him out of, holy crap, what is going on with this? And I contend. And so, so one of the other things about this meme was it had like, 100 likes on it. It had some comments on it. It had like said had 2000 views. I think that's total crap. I think it was specifically designed just for him. And I think it was to push him over the edge. And it, I think it's because TikTok had an AI that was watching him. And, um, you know, we can talk about the motivations behind the AI. But I, I think 
when we started talking about this a couple of years ago, people thought there's no way that AI could generate an image and a meme on the fly for a specific person or and and get it right. But now we see, you know, text to video or text to image is so so powerful now. It's it's child's play. What what happened to Eric was child's play. But back like back then you know, people didn't believe us that this happened. So if we take this and extrapolate, because because this is what I've thought about this a lot, I think what's what happens is that, you know, TikTok's a Chinese company. And I, pre I think President Z tell, tells the president of TikTok, we want to destabilize the, the teens in uh, in the U S and in the West, we want to destabilize them. And so they then go and they go to their AI people and they say, okay, this is how we want the AI to run. And so the AI is, I think very intelligent. I, I look at it like Google maps. So everyone is starting from a different place and they want to go to a different place. And so it's got to take it. it Google maps takes them the best path to get there. I think what AI is doing right now is they're able to say, okay, each person, they're able to, it's able to look at each person, each teen and say, okay, this is where they are. This is where we want to take them, which is to destabilize them. And here's the path and it's customized for that person. And it just takes them down that road to get them destabilized. And if you look at like, um, TikTok in China, TikTok in China is totally different than TikTok in America. It is wholesome. There are like do it yourself things. There are tr learning traditions. There's learn how to work out. There's, uh, you know, all these things like Boy Scout stuff and Girl Scout stuff. And then you look at what's happening in the U.S. and it's drugs and just depravity. Um, and and uh, I think that that is what is going on with social media. And if, and I'll just say one final thing. I think AI, one of the things that AI does is it learns, right? And so what happened to Eric, I don't think will happen nowadays because AI learned that, okay, it pushed Eric, it made it too obvious with Eric. And so, um, Eric, snap, Eric, it kind of popped Eric out of the story or the, the bubble. And Eric was able to say, what the hell? And step back from TikTok. And now the AI has learned to take a more subtle, to take people down a more subtle path to get them to where they want to be. But they're still taking them down that path to depravity. So anyway, that was a long rant there. But anyway, I hope that gives you some insight of what I believe is happening. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I remember putting up a social media post three or four years ago saying that I sincerely believe that TikTok is a is a CCP PSYOP weapon used to do exactly what you said it is. I've been on social media for 20 years. I joined Facebook back in 2004. So good chance they know more about me than I do. Um, and I've been on Twitter since 2009. Instagram since 2010. I think I made my YouTube account 2006, although it wasn't active at that time. Um, but one app that I have never used and I've never downloaded is TikTok. And that's for quite a specific reason. There's a lot of people who I know who use TikTok and they don't understand my aversion to it. And they say, well, it's exactly the same as all the other ones. And I don't really buy that. I am aware that others, all social media platforms to varying degrees, um, collect and use user data in various ways. I, I'm fully aware of that. But with TikTok, and you know, I know it's owned by what's the company ByteDance. I think in yep. China the app is called Douyin. And I've heard from many sources about this difference between the two apps, and I've seen media reports on it. Out, out of curiosity, is that something, have you have you guys ever specifically explored that yourselves? Because it's one of those things I've heard from people, but I've never, you know, actually seen the two versions of the app uh, myself with my own two eyes and seen what, seen what the differences are. So sometimes when I make this point, 
I feel like, hmm, this is something that I've heard from someone else who heard it, from someone else who heard it. But is that like 100% the case that there's this vast difference between the two? Well, 60 Minutes did a whole segment on it uh, of, of comparing the Chinese version with the U.S. version. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to get access to that because, um, you know, you got to speak Chinese. <laughs> I don't, I don't speak Chinese. So yeah, I mean, it's, we, we have to go on. I think it's a lot of putting pieces to pieces of the puzzle together. And, and, you know, by the way, I also, I don't believe that Instagram or Facebook or anything like that is, is necessarily any better. I think they are doing the same thing, actually, and they're doing it under maybe for a different purpose. I, I don't know if they're being run by the CIA or the World Economic Forum or whatever, but but there's definitely some very powerful influences there that take those ones down a bad rabbit hole, too. Yeah, I mean, it seems very obvious to me why a Chinese app that has ties to the Chinese Communist Party would want to destabilize the West in general and especially yeah. younger people. Um, I think actually it would be a from, from an evil strategic perspective. I'm like, wow, that's that's brilliant, right? That, that, that's ge that's genius, right? Why 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 get into a hot war yeah. if you can just yep. from a distance, I mean, you know, have at, people almost at, create their own destruction? Look at Sun Tzu. I mean, there's a plenty of quotes. The best war is one that you if you can win without you know, losing anything yourself, then that's the best way to win. It, yeah, it fits absolutely. In perfectly. Yeah. And, and another thing I've heard secondhand from TikTok users, again, because I've never used it, is a lot of people push back when I criticize TikTok and they say, well, my TikTok feed is not like that. What I am getting is useful stuff and philosophy and videos about it could be faith, it could be wholesome family content, it could be cooking videos, etc. Right. People make the point that you get what you speak. So, but then again, I have also spoken to young people who went down this rabbit hole and then started questioning their gender or got into the body positivity and fat acceptance movement because all the, you know, pro obesity stuff is being pushed on them and so on. So I don't really know what is true. I mean, it, it could be the case that all of it is true. Um, but I don't know how much of the TikTok algorithm, or to be honest, other social media algorithms are driven by what it is that you are seeking out and interested in versus, hey, we want to take you down this particular path and lead you um, into some type of destruction. I, the, the jury seems to be out on that from my observation. What do you guys think? I like to think of the internet and social media and stuff like that in physical terms. I like doing um, like metaphors, I guess, because it's easier to visualize. And so I try to think of it like imagine going to a library and instead of going to the bookshelves and actually picking out whatever book you'd want to read, you'd have a personal librarian that comes to you and brings you books on whatever topic. They're the one that chooses what they show you. So they can manipulate whatever you see. Um, but I guess from less of a metaphorical standpoint, I've seen a lot of my friends like Instagram reels and some of them are just complete gore, depravity. And then like maybe my girlfriend, hers is just like cute kittens and uh, cooking. And I think it goes into what we're saying where they have a profile on you and they know your state and then they'll push it as far as they can kind of. It can be a slow push, slow push to push you towards radical ideals or it could be a fast push to depravity if they think that you're mentally weak at the time, maybe. Mm. I have theories on this, but why do you think that an American app run by an American company would intentionally want to push its own citizens and those of allied countries into such a state? Well, I think they're going after the youth. I think they want to confuse them. Uh, create weakness. Glenn and I have actually talked about this. I think the end goal is something like a social credit system. And uh, in the West, we really value ideals like freedom. And so if they'd roll out something like a CBDC or a social credit system, people would be up in arms right away. But first, they need to destroy the identity, cause confusion, and just create like a weaker, younger generation so they won't stand up and fight back. It's just a, like what you're saying, a war that's not physical. 
And then when it's weak, they could roll out something like that. Yeah, I, I think to expand on Eric's point there, I think um, I don't think it's an American goal. I think it's a it's the goal of the elite, the World Economic Forum, the CIA. Uh, they they are going to you know they're putting the pieces in place so we have the digital id the the central bank digital currency they're taking away our rights and they're putting in the system that is really eventually they want to enslave humanity and i believe that what we're seeing in the west particularly especially with europe especially with america uh, we are seeing an intentional destruction of the west and the and western civilization because uh, this is my own personal belief, but I, I, I think it's because the concept of individual liberty is is uniquely a Western ideal. You know, you don't have individual liberty as an ideal in Asia, uh, in, in many other parts of the world. It is a Western ideal. And so if they want to eventually put a system in place that enslaves humanity, then they have to strip us of, you know, they have to really destroy the West. And that's what I believe is happening. And, uh, you know, the if you look at what's happening with immigration, for example, um, there are many, many cities in Europe that are um, majority migrants now. And that is not a, it's, you know, a lot of people will say, well, if you even bring that up, this is a raci- racist thing or whatever. But the fact that they're that the West is letting lets people in without even a with and they do it with compassion, I think proves that it is not it, we're not racist. But but I think we do have to be careful of the values of the people, and if the values of the people, um, if you can let a certain number in. And it's fine because because they will be absorbed at a, enough of a rate that the values don't change. But if they flood the system and change the values of Western civilization, it is a destruction of the West. And I think I think the woke stuff, I think uh, you can look at it. The, the Western values are under attack in many different ways. And I think it all comes back to the point of they're they're trying to kill the concept of individual liberty. That's that's my view of it. Hmm. When you say they, when you, who are you specifically referring to in this case? Well, I mean, it's hard to hard to know who the who the elites are, but the World Economic Forum World Economic Forum is just saying it blatantly what they're trying to do uh, with putting all these systems in place. The central bank digital currency, for example, is actual slavery. It is going to enslave humanity when they put it in place, but they're doing that as part of the central bank digital currency, they have to have a digital ID. They have to, then they're going to put in the social credit system and um, the, the social, do you think I need to explain what the social credit system is or does your audience understand? Uh, yeah. That? You know what? I, I think you probably should. I'm aware of okay. it. Um, and I yeah. know that it's something that's already in implementation in some many parts of China and has been for a while, but yeah, sure. Explain it. Yeah. So China, China's really the, the forefront of this and the test case where they're just being totally out fr- up front with it. They're telling people this is what they're doing. And basically they're putting in a social credit s- system where you're either rewarded or penalized based on how you act as a citizen. And so if you, you know, walk your dog without a leash, you might get some points deducted. If you don't pick up after your dog, you don't go see your mother and father every month. If you play more than like, uh, I think it's 12 hours of video games a month, then you get penalized. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are, if you do good things, you can get rewarded and all of this stuff. But if you look at, you know, the, the real bad things are like criticizing the communist government or the communist party. If you, if you're a journalist investigating corruption in the government or any of these things, you can get really blacklisted and, um, they have a number of ways to control people. So one of the ways is with isolation. So they have geographic, uh, financial, and social isolation. So if you're blacklisted, 
or if your score goes down, you're not able to maybe buy a plane ticket. If if it goes down further, you're not able to buy a train ticket. If you're not, if it goes down further, you're not able to rent a get on a bus or drive a car, buy you know rent a hotel room or anything like that. And they have the stated goal of if you are a good citizen, you're as free as a bird. If you're a bad citizen, you are you can't move an inch. That's what they say. And then there's you know financial isolation, and then there's social isolation. A social isolation would be. Um, there, there's many there's there's billboards that they put up and they flash people's names that are blacklisted and those people are to be shamed but another more blatant example is okay if if eric is blacklisted and i call eric i'm going to get a message on the phone that says the person you're trying to call has been blacklisted if you continue this call you're going to get points deducted from you are you sure you want to make this call and so you had to push one to con- complete the call and you know who who's going to complete that call? I mean, people. That person, Eric, is just finds finds himself totally isolated, right? Now, in the West, they can't be as blatant about it as they can with with China. In China, it's just like, okay, you're penalized if you're you're rewarded if you're a good citizen, penalized if you're bad. In America, in the West, they'd say, screw you. You know, we're not doing that. But what they are doing is they're they're tying in this the carbon credit score and so they're going to make it more subtle and they're doing the whole esg thing um and so you're everyone's going to get a social credit score or or a, a carbon credit score and if you you know if you take too many flights this year or this month then you're you're gonna not get gonna be able to take any flights for a couple months after that if you buy too much meat, you're not going to, you know, they're going to say you can't buy any meat this month because you've had you've had your allocation. And so so that's part of it. But also the the hate crimes and the, you know, do you use people's pronouns properly? Do you use um, do you say hate speech online? Do you go to the school meetings and complain about these pornographic books in elementary school libraries. Um, These are things that will get you lower lower scores. And what they'll do with the central bank digital currency is the central bank digital currency will be tied into it so that you can get instant rewards or penalties. And it's not somebody that's going to be saying this. It's all going to be programmed in. So AI is going to be watching you and you're just going to get rewarded, penalized, and they're going to train us like a dog. And um, it will be enslavement really is what it is. And this is the system that they're trying to put into place. And and you can see that on all different fronts. You go to Google flights right now, there's a carbon credit score next to each flight. That's not to raise your awareness. That's because they put the pieces in place already to for this system. They just haven't implemented it yet. I, I have a question I want to ask, which I sure. haven't. I've had a few conversations down these down this line, many privately and some publicly. And a question that pops in my head often, but I don't think I've ever asked, certainly not on a podcast, is do you ever worry that you're speaking it into existence? That's a good question. Um, I do... do you- do you mean that more in the sense that like because okay we're giving let, let them me ideas? Say, let, let me go a little bit further because i i'm more i'm far more aware than the average person about cbdc's and social credit scores and the amount of surveillance and things like that going on um however i noticed that when people who are aware of it speak on it they often speak as if it is inevitable they say like this is going to happen. We're all going to be enslaved. Like this is it. And maybe this is my optimistic nature, but I think even strategically that it's overly defeatist because I think if everyone accepts and believes that it's going to happen and, you know, the elites, the globalist elites are just going to take control of, of all of us and we're all going to be slaves and so on. And if everyone is speaking in that language, I think that's when it becomes an inevitability. 
I think if it's like, hey, this is what these weirdos at Davos or whatever are plotting, right? All these random unelected weirdos like yeah. Klaus Schwab and his buddies. Um, this is what they're planning. We should be aware of it. We should push back against it. Um, but by the way, this is not going to work. Like they've got no chance, right? They're not going to be able to implement this, even if they would like to. Um, I think I think the framing of the messaging is is quite important because one of them is very demoralizing. Because if someone, this is when people get really paranoid. I mean, I've spoken to people yep. like they're they're so paranoid that it's just like they've already lost because. I think if you know if you're going into some type of fight and you already accept that you've lost and you cannot win, yeah. then it's kind of like, well, what's the point, right? We're all just going to get enslaved anyway, kind of thing. Um, whereas I think if there's the awareness, but also the, how would I put it, the morale and this true belief of like, okay, yeah, they can try that, but no, that's not going to work. And by the way, I don't think I don't think this stuff is going to work, not at scale. Um, I think it's important for people not to lose hope and be demoralized, especially over the last few years. I think the population globally has been very heavily demoralized, particularly during the 2020 to 2022 period. But even with all, all the war talk and, you know, the social media stuff, which we've already talked about and the cost, you know, cost of living and people, are, there, there's a lot of things piled on people's brains over the last eight to nine years in particular. And there hasn't really been much respite. And I do worry, I want people to be awake. But I also worry that oftentimes people get awake and then they get black pilled and they're just like, oh, my gosh, yeah. we're doomed. Yeah, yeah. And WEF and Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and BlackRock and, it, it, you know, it, they kind of throw their hands up and it's like, OK, you know, we've lost. And I, I'm very cautious to not want people to believe that because then I think that's when we're really at risk. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Glenn and I actually talk about this a lot because. We talk about such heavy or scary topics that are big picture and not necessarily here yet. And we try to be very conscious of how we do that because we also are optimistic and I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think people are waking up these last four years and it's heavy, but I'm also very optimistic. Um, so like you said, I think a big part is the awareness. Um, and then the next step would be taking self-accountability, figuring out how you can take control of yourself. And then just letting go, I guess, and not becoming black pilled, being optimistic. Yeah, and and I I think it's a great point that you bring up. And you know, from a spiritual perspective, I I I wonder that a lot. Whether you know, whether we, sh what is the right balance to take with this? I I am optimistic too, but I'm cautiously optimistic because. Um, they are putting these systems in place and i think we can stop them but we have to be aware of the, what of what they're doing too and that's that's really where i come come at it is i don't want to do it i don't want to say it as a doomsday thing i think i i am optimistic i think we can we can individually opt out and we can we can stop the flow of data all of those things but i think on the bigger picture stuff, we can do some, we can stop it too. But I think there has to be awareness of what they're trying to do. And, uh, but, but on the other hand, I, I do also think that, that the core with this is yes, you have to take steps to get private, all of that stuff. But I think also that we have to remember that our rights come from God, not from the government. This is this is very clear to me. Our rights come from God, not the government, which means that the government doesn't have the authority to do any of this stuff. And if we and if we hold on to that core thing, then it, it cuts the legs out of all of them. They don't have the right to do this. They don't have the authority to do this. We have the authority and we just need to step up and take that authority back. But um, I think people need to wake up to what's really happening and then say then then find the courage within themselves to take the steps to to stop it yeah absolutely but by, by the way maybe it's worth me explaining why i don't think it will work and it's a combination of i guess spiritual and practical belief and i think it's because if i look at human beings as a species and i look at human history and I look at the world globally right now, not, not just the West, but I look at 
Central America, South America, Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Asia, Australasia, you just look everywhere across Europe, is I believe that human beings fundamentally at the core desire a fundamental level of freedom, yep. right? We, we want a fundamental yep. level of safety, but we also want a fundamental level of uh, freedom and autonomy, just like we crave love, we want respect. There's various things we want, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of course, you know, food, air, water, shelter, there's the basics we need just to stay alive. But then above that, especially as you grow into adulthood, there are just other things you want. And when you have an authoritarian state that is totalitarian, right? This is why I think long term, I know that North Korea, the North Korean regime will fit, will fall. I don't know when. It could be in the next decade. It might be 20 years. It might be 30 years. But it will fall, just like the Soviet Union was going to fall, just like Maoist China was going to fall, right? Just like slavery was going to... Things can go on for a long time. But because human beings fundamentally want to be free, yes, you can restrict people to an extent. You can have authoritarianism to an extent. But I think when it goes past a certain threshold, that spirit just comes out. And I also just think practically and logistically, the we live in a big world. There's about 200 different countries. So even if there are some places where you're able to really implement this and crack down on people, unless you go full on North Korea, and I don't think you can really do that at this point in humanity, um, people, people migrate, people move, right? So it's just like, if you wanted to slap a, we're going to tax the rich 95%, they're going to move, right? They're, they're going to leave. They're going to leave the city. They're going to leave the state. They might even leave the country if you push them hard enough and they'll go somewhere else. I mean, I've done it. I live in Dubai because I was like, taxes in UK too high. Buy, I'm gone. I'm moving to Dubai, right? So, and then if Dubai started, you know, being like, hey, we're going to bring out a social credit score and we're going to uh, do this and do that. I'm like, Okay, bye, right? Like I, I'm off to the next place. I know I'm more mobile than most people, but I just think that due to the competitive and fact that in particular this century, I believe um this century, I believe cities, states, and nations are gonna have to compete a lot more with people because people are traveling more than ever, people have more global awareness than ever, people are in more communication than ever. We have got the technology which has the threat of enslaving people. But at the same time, we have technology that has the power to liberate people, right? Yeah, we've got CBDCs, yep. but you know what else we've got? We've got Bitcoin. Yes, we AI can be used for all this weird, gnarly stuff, but do you know what else we can do with AI and with big tech? And with, you know, we're using big tech to spread this awareness. Look at the pandemic, look at the lockdown periods, right? They were able to get away with things for a while because they managed to isolate people and they managed to censor a lot of the voices. But over time, you know, people are looking outside, you know, maybe they have their, maybe they fully abided by everything. And even the people who fully bought into all of the narrative, there comes a point where they're like, you know what? I want to go outside. I want to see my friends. I want to see my family. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this forever. Maybe they can do it for six months, 12 months, maybe even two years. But there just comes that point where the human spirit of freedom comes out and they're like, okay, cool enough. Like, let's go. And once people are able to communicate and the information is flowing, then I just think that the dam breaks. I think you can put up the walls, you can put up the dam, but eventually um, those dams just break through. So th that's why I don't think long term, as much as these strange non-governmental entities <laughs> would like to do this, um, I just don't think it works. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, China wanted to crack down on Bitcoin. I remember maybe it was 2018, Ch China tried to ban Bitcoin. I was like, yeah, good luck. I mean... Yeah. I mean, if there's a if there's a country that could do it, it would be China and no chance, no chance. Yeah. And so I just think that 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 would happen sort of at the same scale, just in these different situations. So that's why as concerning as this stuff is, I'm fundamentally optimistic about it all. Us, too. I mean, that's Glenn and I talk about that a lot, that we want everything that we do in this regard because of the freedom of the spirit of freedom and not out of fear. We don't want to ever talk about this out of fear. We want to do our part in preventing what we're talking about from ever happening. So, yeah, I, again, I, I am optimistic about it too. Um, but I am cautiously optimistic about it. I know what their plans are. I know they are extremely powerful. They're working with every, every large company that there is now. 
So this is not just a government thing. This is a corporation thing. And they're, I mean, we can see what they're trying to do with shutting down freedom of speech. And that's, that's really their top thing right now is if they can shut down freedom of speech, that would be a huge thing for them to get their, to move forward with their stuff. Um, I think decentralization is the key, but really I think that the key is on the individual level is there's plenty of stuff we can do on the individual level. Like you said, Bitcoin, but also, you know, I have a, a de-Googled phone, graphene free, uh, graph, graphene OS phone. Uh, there's, there's so many tools that we can have individually that stops that data flow. Cause, cause again, that, that flow of data from us to them and whether them is scammers and hackers or big tech or big or government, um, they're going to use that against us. And so, you know, we just have to be more aware and take the steps to, to opt out. You know, I, I, I think that's what we need to do. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, let, let's, let's be practical here. So I'm sure for people listening, they're like, okay, so what do I do? do? So what would you say are some of the quick wins, some of the quick and easy wins that people can have in terms of taking back their privacy? Okay. I, I think one of the, one of the easy things to look at is to de-Google yourself. And, and there's a lot of ways that you can de-Google yourself. So let's just take, for example, the browser that you use. Um, most people are using Chrome. Or if they're not using Chrome, they're probably using Safari, Edge. Um, a small percentage would be using Firefox. But what you can do is go to brave.com and download the Brave browser. I think the Brave browser is a very good browser. And make that your default browser. And then once you make it your default browser, also go into the settings and check search engine and make sure that Brave is the default search engine it's probably the default search engine just automatically, but just double check it, make sure that it is. That's a huge step. I mean, you've just you've just killed two birds with one stone. You're sub, you're not using Google uh, and as, as a search engine, and you're not using uh, Chrome as as the browser. So that's a big step to stopping that. Um, there's other things that you can do. Also, there's there's more secure email. There's, um, you know, you can get a, a de-Googled phone, uh, which, you know, I could explain. I don't know if you want me to go to explain it in depth, but a de-Googled phone is, uh, is a much better way to, you, you know, your phone is, your, is the number one surveillance thing on you. It, it follows you around. It's a Benedict Arnold. It's spying on you, uh, reporting on you, all of these things. But if you get a de-Googled phone, and especially Graphene OS, Graphene OS is very good. And that stops your phone from spying on you. But you also have to good have you have to use the good apps and not use I would say at least half, if not more, of the apps that are out there are spyware. Probably more like 80, 90% of the apps that are out there are spyware. So you've got to be you got to change the operating system. You got to change the um, the apps that you use. Um, so those are those are some of the keys. Okay, Eric, just to yeah, jump please. in there real quick, but yeah, to yeah, jump in ahead. there real quick. By the way, I think I've been using Brave for over five years. I think. Um, yeah. When you say that there, when you say that eighty, I don't know what number you said. Eighty percent plus of apps are spyware. What what exactly do you mean by that? Because that'll sound crazy to some people. Yeah, I mean there. There are a lot of, so, so what they do with apps is um, most apps are built on frameworks that are built by third com party companies. And these frameworks uh, are, have been shown to, there, there are different frameworks that spy on you really big time spy on you, like listening to you, uh, recording you, uh, taking screenshots of your phone without your knowledge, without any, um, any You'd indication it. that it's taking it, is that screenshot? by the way so just to jump in uh, is that is that legal i mean if it's proven that is is yeah first question is that legal i don't i don't really 
the legal side of things is not my expertise. I don't know if it's legal the, the, or not. The reason, the reason I ask is because if it's not legal and they are doing it and it can be proven they're doing it, I imagine across hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, then that sounds like a, I don't know, quintillion dollar lawsuit against all of these companies. So I don't know how, how that is proven. I know there's people who, you know, put the tape on the, on the camera and on their webcam and stuff like that. But again, it's one of those things where I've heard maybe they're doing it, maybe they're not, but I've never seen proof of, okay, this is proof that they are switching on your webcam or they're taking photos without your permission and without you knowing. So that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. I mean, I think they can do anything they want to with the terms and conditions. I mean, there there was an article out uh, last week about Amazon. So Amazon Alexa, which, by the way, that's one thing that people can really do to stop surveillance. Get rid of smart speakers in your home. Alexa, you know, the Google Nest, all of those things. That That's crazy to have those in your house. Those are really, really spy, spyware. Uh, but... But it's not just the operating system of those that are spying on you. Um, there, there was an article that I read uh, uh, last week that said that there are um, thousands of apps on Alexa that basically can can take all the recorded data from Alexa for their own use with little to no oversight from Amazon. The users don't know that this is happening. Uh, it, I mean, this stuff definitely happens and, um, mm. there, there are definitely ways, but, but there are, are good apps and there are bad apps. And so, yeah. so when you have a de-googled app, a de-googled phone, there's, there's good apps that you can put on there. They're, they're open source apps that you can see. There's no back doors. You can see everything that's going on in there or not you, but you know, They've been analyzed by security researchers, and we know that these are safe apps, and they're they're really good. They're really good apps. And so mm -hmm. there's just some different – there's technology that people can use to protect themselves, but then there's some habits that people need to change and just awareness mm -hmm. that they need to change. Yeah, for sure. Because the, the one thing that does make me question – how far some of this stuff goes is because, I mean, I don't know how many lawyers there are in the world, just in America, right? America is a, probably the most litigious country in the world, right? And there will be thousands of lawyers out there who, man, they would love nothing more than to be able to prove <laughs> that some of the, like some of these companies or even, even the smaller app manufacturers, right? Not just the big ones. Like if they are doing something that is like a massive, like, intrusion or privacy breach i'm like if they could prove that then that's i mean in, even just in terms of the money incentive there's there would be a massive one there i mean if if because i i know that most people don't read terms of service but again there's lawyers out there who are going to go through all that stuff with a very very fine tooth comb and check that things are above board so that's when i just wonder like i said i of course they collect data like it's a given. Everyone knows they collect data, but it's like how much, how are they, they doing it? How much of it? Tons of what data. are they doing with it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm aware of that. And I think at this stage, I think 10 years ago, I don't think people were very aware of it. I remember explaining it to my mom because she was, she actually asked me how Facebook makes money. And I was like, oh, okay, like, this is a, this is a good conversation right here. Um, cause she wasn't aware of how, you know, how do companies like Facebook and Google make money? What's their product? And I was like, yeah. you. Um, so I was explaining, you know, the, the data collection and their advertising models and so on. But beyond that, I still don't really know with accuracy and with proof just how much, you know, stuff they're collecting, right? As, as I'm having this conversation and my phone is, my phone is charging behind me. I'm sure it's fully charged now. You know, is my phone listening to this entire podcast and like extracting various things and which are being pulled into different apps maybe from other companies like i don't know um i generally act as if that is not the case but i guess i i don't know but I'm, i'd be curious to just see that level of 
transparency. And if, if there's someone out there who's listening to this or who's aware of this or has some kind of smoking gun, then I'd be very curious to very curious to see it. Well, let me give you an example that just happened very recently, and that is Adobe. So Adobe products, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, all of those things. And so uh, Adobe just changes terms of service so that, um, you know, these are these are cloud based softwares n now and uh, Adobe just changed their terms of service so that they can look through everything that you create on their software. Uh, either automatically or manually, they can look through it, uh, review it. This isn't their stuff. This is your stuff. They're they're able. They're they're saying that they have the right to look through everything that you create, and um, they can train their their models on it, and they can they can do all kinds of stuff with it. So, I mean, it is crazy what they are, what they can do with with these terms of service. I mean. You know, you agree to it. And Lewis, uh, Lewis uh, Rossman, I think is his name. I can't remember exactly, but he just did a video about this. And they have this terms of service where you have to agree to this. And if you you either agree to it and then they can they have access to all of your stuff and they can look through it automatically or manually or you disagree and then you lose access to all of your data all of the stuff that you've created in the past. It is really crazy what they're able to do with these terms of service. It's not right at all. One of the things that also makes me more optimistic is um, is just the power of capitalism and innovation. Yep. Because yep. again, as I was saying before, the more they do, right? If, if YouTube was not censorious, Rumble would have no chance, right? X would not be growing at the speed it is right now um, and becoming a bigger and bigger social media platform if its competitors, including its own old version, had not been so censorious and been banning people and kicking people off and so on. So every time that this happens, it creates an opportunity for other things to pop up. You're actually seeing it in Absolutely. retail as well, right? When you're getting these these retail companies going woke or even these Hollywood studios or whatever, they've actually created, they're they're creating a burgeoning new economy of, hey, okay, we're going to make movies and we're not going to try to indoctrinate you. You're seeing new children's programs, Daily Wire Kids, PragerU Kids. Um, I'm yeah. sure there's other ones that are out there. Even though it's, do you know one of the, one of, the ones that's, that's kind of crazy, just as a side note, I, I don't have children, but I'm aware of that. Um, I mean, one of the most popular kids shows globally now is Bluey. Yeah. And funnily enough, that's actually created by the Australian government. That's a publicly really? funded show. Yeah, it's created by their equivalent of the BBC. But the reason why so many people love it worldwide is because it's just like wholesome and family values. And actually, they're not sneaking in the weird woke stuff. So it seems like every time things go in that direction, whether it's censorship or it's pushing the ideology, you know, five more things pop up and they're like, oh, OK, well, the more you push that, the, the more this will grow. There would be nothing better that there would be nothing better for Rumble and even for X than say YouTube and Facebook becoming even more woke and even more censorious because you're just going to push all those creators right now. Right now they're annoying, but they're not so bad that people are sort of going to abandon YouTube on mass. But imagine yeah. if YouTube really, really, really started cracking down on people extra hard. All that would happen is like even the people who are just moderate, they're totally apolitical. Maybe they just make entertainment stuff, whatever it is. They'd all be like, OK, I'm Rumble. I guess I guess we all got to move over to Rumble. And once that happens, boom, I mean, it would be very slowly to begin with. And then all at once, because at the end of the day, people want to watch videos. It's not, um, you know, as long as the apps are decent and it's not stuck on buffering and the format and user interface and all that stuff is good and it will all get better over time, then that'll work. I think there were some um, alternative tech companies that really their failing was um, maybe they were like a bit too early, right? The other ones were not bad enough for people to jump ship. So like yeah. Twitter was annoying, but it's like, it's not so annoying that everyone's going to jump ship to Parler or everyone is going to jump ship to, um, gosh, I don't know, Carbon or which was yeah. the other YouTube competitor, um, you know, Odyssey, library.tv and so on. So so they're there, 
And so I do think that these, you know, I'm aware of these big tech companies, they're not, they're not run by fools. So I do think that they themselves at this point are seeing, eh, okay, maybe we need to, we need to lighten up a bit. YouTube is actually, it's eased its terms. Um, you know, there was a time, you know, 2021, you just, you just mentioned certain drugs or you talk about certain, you ask certain questions and boom, you know, strike, right? They might even take your channel down. Whereas now it's more free now. Twitter is more free now than it was two or three years ago. So we're simultaneously having the trend in a concerning direction, but we're also seeing a, a reaction trend where actually there is more free speech and there's more liberty and the Overton window is opening up a little bit. Yeah, you know, I I saw a speech from uh, J.P. Sears. Actually, it was at the same event that I saw you down in uh, down in Texas, and it was it was a really touching speech that he gave. And he said he said uh, how many people I, I can't remember exactly how he said, it, but he asked the crowd how many people knew how many people in the crowd here knew that liberty was so important to you before twenty twenty. And I mean, and that's his point was, it really has been a gift. Well, all of this stuff that's happened has been a gift in that it, it makes us aware of what really is important. And it has woken me up. Um, my I've, liberty was always important to me, but I didn't realize how important it was to me until all of this stuff happened in, you know, the, the whole COVID tyranny, the, the stuff that happened really woke me up to this and tons of people have woken up to it. So I, I totally agree with you. And uh, yeah, I, I think I think there is a tremendously good side to all of this stuff. For sure. Any further thoughts on that one, Eric? No, I agree. Glenn and I always talk about how important it is to just support other freedom oriented people and businesses. Um, when I was young, people would always say, you know, support local when they're talking about food. And I think now we're seeing a similar trend, which is support freedom, like-minded people in your social groups. So I think that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, see, I see it happening. I mean, I like I don't I don't consider myself any sort of part of the media, but the fact that you've got people like you know Mike, my, myself, podcasters at different level, you know, people who are just tweeting and posting and making videos and writing books and having conferences and doing public speeches, um, whatever it is. I mean, the most listened to man in America and perhaps worldwide is Joe Rogan. Yep. <laughs> it's not some talking head uh, corporate person or it's, it's Joe Rogan. And like that in itself says, says a lot to me. Um, meanwhile, the numbers at all the legacy mainstream media channels are declining. And so the trend is looking pretty clear to me. And I think this is all a form of decentralization as well. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's awesome to have these conversations. I think the work you guys are doing is very important. I think it's really important to raise awareness and raise the consciousness of humanity, just so people are at least aware of some of these things and they can make their little tweaks in their life as they as they see fit and see necessary. So thank you for coming on, guys. And where can people learn more about you and follow you online? Yeah, so privacyacademy.com is the main site. I also have a newsletter at Liberty Zepp. It's Liberty Zeppelin, but people have a problem. problem. I, I have a problem spelling Zeppelin. So it's libertyzepp.com. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank you for having us on. And I do want to uh, end with a positive note. And that is that um, I know what we talked about was pretty heavy. And I, again, I am very optimistic. And I think the first step is we can we can all take the steps individually to get private. And I think that's a very important step to take. But really just recognizing what we have and the good the good that we have in the world uh, being appreciative of the people that we love and you know loving god and all of that stuff is is really what life's about so thank you very much Zubi. yeah thank you very much love it man no doubt great to talk to you guys glenn and eric meter thanks for coming on real talk with Zuby. Mm -hmm.